speak equally. Excuse me, um, this month we are um, exploring the topic, eco-anxiety informed by African perspectives. So we'll be in conversation with two young, young Africans, which I'll be introducing shortly. So TIP is a short form for the Eco-Anxiety Africa Project, a project by Tosti Vibes. Uh, TIP is aimed at understanding and validating the experiences of eco-anxiety and um, environmental related emotions in Africans. Uh, thank you all for joining in once again. I'm looking forward to a very insightful time with you all. I would like to meet you all. So if you'd kindly write your name, where you're from, and in one word or in a sentence, what you feel when you hear the word eco-anxiety in the chat box. I would like to read from you all. So your name, your location, and one word or sentence, what you feel when you hear the word eco-anxiety. I hope you can all hear me. Oh, yes. Kimi says, I live in England and she feels understood when she hears the word echo anxiety. Thank you, Amy. I feel that way too. Cynthia said, uh, she's from the UK. Hi, Cynthia. And the way she hears echo anxiety, she, what, what comes to her mind is if the activism she carries out in the fashion industry will make a difference. Wow, Cynthia, hopefully it does. Uh, Isabel lives in Arlo, UK, and uh, works with Cambridge Climate Therapist. Nice to have you here, Isabel. Jamie is from the UK. And he thinks um, eco-anxiety or anxiety is what unites us. I really love that answer, Jamie. Yes, that's true. Everybody connects because of our worry for the climate or about um, Earth and our future on Earth. So yes, I relate to that too. Mazida is from Canada and she says eco-anxiety makes her feel anxious. Hmm. Yeah, she says, she also says it, does, it feels like we aren't doing enough. Yeah, I can relate to that actually, especially from our leaders and from the top. It feels like we're not doing enough to protect ourselves, to protect the planet. Imogen is from England and she says that um, she's an ecotherapist. Nice, nice. And when she has eco-anxiety, what comes to her mind is empathy and fear. Hmm. Yeah, I love that, empathy. Okay, so thank you all so much for your comments. I, I look forward to this session. I feel like I know we are going to have a pretty amazing time. Uh, so before we go ahead, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, kindly mute your microphones. If you have any questions, just type them down into the chat box. I will bring them up during the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So the way the webinar is going to go, uh, we are going to have a panel discussion with our participants. And then after that, we move to the Q&A session and then we just wrap up. Uh, and if you miss anything, it's fine. We are going to record, we are recording this session and we are going to put out a recording by next week. So you'll be able to come back to it and then listen up. Welcome, Annie. Nice to meet you. So for our newcomers, if you can just drop your name, where you're from, and uh, 
in one word or in the sentence, what you feel when you get the word echo anxiety into the chat box? Uh, so now we can begin. Today, like I mentioned earlier, we'll be hearing the thoughts of two African youths, Shilos Maziti and uh, Lekwa Ope. So I would like to read their bio and share my screen while doing that. Can we all see my screen now? Oh yeah, okay. So I would go with Shilot Bio first. Shilot Masiti is a young, excuse me, Shilot Masiti is a young environmental activist from South Africa. She's a psychology student with a passion for collective interventions for, for mankind's collective trauma. She is the founder of She for Ed, an organization that's educating children and youth about environmental crisis with solutions rooted in Ubuntu. She is a volunteer at Force of Nature, a social change ambassador at Tread Media, and a younger 2021 youth delegate. She is a member and she is a member and climate cafe facilitator for at Climate Psychology Anime um, Alliance, rather, excuse me. And she's also an anime fan. Hi, Sheila, it's so nice to have you here. Uh, I would go ahead to read Lekwa's bio. Uh, so Lekwa Hope is a sustainability champion and researcher with a focus on climate change and economic development. He understands the gap in climate education and sustainability knowledge in the Nigerian space. And that is why he's devoted to closing the gap with research and other styles of publication. He has worked with a number of networks like Renewable Energy and Environmental Sustainability, RIS Africa, International Climate Change Development Initiative, ICCD High, Mock COP26, a mock event of the UNFCCC Conference of Party, and a team of young adults from different parts of the world on climate anxiety. And finally, he also works with Susti Vibes, where he leads the research team. I Lekwa, nice to meet you. And nice to have you here with us. Uh, so we'll just go straight ahead to the questions that we had for them. Uh, I would go, I'll start with Shilot first. So Shilot, can you hear me? Hi, Shilot. Oh, um, I think Sheila just got disconnected. So we'll just go ahead with Lekwa. Hi, Lekwa. Lekwa, can you hear me? Sorry, I was having a bit of issues with my connection, but yeah, I can hear you clearly. Yeah. yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to have you here, Lekwa. Same. Thank you, guys. I'm so pleased to be here. Honestly. Yeah. So, uh, the first question we have today is: um, Now, in this world that we are in, we are navigating difficult times globally: climate change, ecological disorders, everything. So, how do you feel? What does that? What emotion does that incite in you when you just hear news about climate change and stuff like that? Um. Well, uh, the, the what well, my answer to that is it's not it's it's not something that's you know singular. 
you know, what, what, what I can actually just, you know, characterize, characterize it as is, um, you know, quite unfortunate, you know, sadness that, that, that engulfs the whole thing because, you know, like Africa is already one that has some already on the land issues and, you know, climate change being, climate change being, being a multiplier effect, you know, multiplies all this, all this problem. And you see that, you know, um, in the future, you know, the, the burden in Africa when it comes to the impact of climate is going to worsen actually. And that's what gets me proud about the future you know, as an African. Yeah, I can relate to that. The fact that we have, um, we are not even emitting as much um, gases, right? <laughs> we are not that industrialized. Yes, but then we feel the brunt, we've, we've started feeling the brunt of uh, climate change, flooding, increased temperature, um, ocean reclaiming land in different areas. There's one area here in Ayetoro, um, Ondo State in Nigeria, where the ocean has started reclaiming um, the shoreline, uh, covering properties. People now have to move inland, turning people to refugees. So those things are really quite shocking when you see things like that. Yeah. I was also seeing something in the news about um, India and then the heat wave. I saw a photo of people sleeping outside. And it's really, I, I can't even explain it. It's so annoying. Like, why are we the ones experiencing this? Especially as Africans, we are not so developed. We are not even producing so much. But we get the brunt of everything at the end. It is um, very annoying for me. I, 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 OK. Yeah, sorry about that. If I should also add, it was also very unfortunate about the situation is that, you know, you know, it, I, feel, I feel like the, the issue lies on two levels, you know. Firstly, uh, you know, we, we don't obviously have, we don't have sufficient ways to adapt and mitigate these, these changes. And that alone, first of all, you know, causes some kind of trauma, both physically and mentally, of course. And then when, when, we, when we know that we're not, we are unable to actually get these resources to actually reduce this, 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 uh, this, this impact, it's, it leads to a whole lot of, a whole lot of trauma that, that can actually be going to into worse up person than the last time when it comes to the mental health. Yeah, I can relate to that. Uh, Sheila is not back yet. I, I don't really want to move to the next question we have here. I guess her next up went off. Uh, she said they might not be having lights. Africa won't take it. So. <laughs> But <laughs> let's just uh, move on to the next question. When Shilot gets back, we'll catch up with her. Yeah. Uh, so the next question here is, what events trigger your climate-related emotion? Like, when did you feel, oh, uh, this, this emotion I'm feeling is relating to climate change or it's because of the flood or the weather or something that is making you feel that way. So when when did you start feeling that way? Um, okay, let me, let me let me just start by you know answering the question that you know in my in my in my personality, right? I I kind of weigh service, you know, to people over anything else, you understand? And um I was watching the news a couple of weeks ago and uh and there was a flood in South Africa, actually, a flash flood in South Africa that, um, that caused the loss of life of about 400 persons. And amongst mm -hmm. those 400 persons, a woman lost two of her children, both young ladies. And, you know, me being a person that wishes to serve humanity as long as possible and having together kind of needs. You know, it's, it's such a Debbie Downer. It's such, you know, it's, it's something that just weighs you down entirely mentally and mentally and emotionally because you can't even, like, you know, get real work done. So, you know, um, the question was how, how, um, yeah, you how know, did you get to feel through? like the first time you felt like you felt this emotion? I'm like, oh, it is relating to climate change, it is tied to the changing climate. Well, yeah, like I, that also, what I was discussed right now. And uh, I think initially, right, I, I used to love, uh, I still love actually the greeneries and all those things, right? And the plants and the trees and the highs and the lows of, of, of the hills. And, you know, cause I used to hike a lot. And 
I, I think I went back to the same place like three years or like four years after, after my first hike to that place. And I noticed that, you know, that there were certain changes. Like before it used to be very green before, you know, but now yeah. it's, it was, you're just, you're just gray grasses all, I mean, yeah. Something like, you know, gray grasses all over. And it was just really unfortunate. And it now made me like understand like, okay, this is what we are having now. Just imagine how it's going to be in the future. You know, it kind of made me paranoid about everything. So like these events are many more actually have what actually make me, made me realize that, okay, this the way the way I'm actually feeling right now concerning this this thing that are changing, okay, yeah. it could be it could be related to climate change. Also made me like realize. Yeah, that's 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 a sad experience. So I would say mine was um Lake Chad. I used to like oh. geography in secondary school. I studied geography in uni. So in secondary school, when we check the map and we see Lake Chad and we see like, oh, well, Lake Chad is like uh, the primary water source for people in Northeast Nigeria. So, and then in secondary school, it was still, I didn't really understand. I, I knew um, the lake was shrinking, but I didn't really understand. Um, why was yes why what was going on and then i took a course in university and the lecturer explained everything in depth and then um the the, the effects of the shrinking to those people droughts lots of um loss of farm um, food loss of land they can't farm they don't have water to feed their animals or even their plants so it is so then i started feeling can climate change cause this? Like I was feeling for those people, imagine not having water to, 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 to you know, feed your animals or to even drink, rationing your water. Like it was so, I couldn't imagine it in my head. And from there, I just started feeling, wow, what will happen to me? Is the drought going to spread down to the south of Nigeria? <laughs> I know I can still see forests here, but are they going to go <laughs> off soon? <laughs> so yeah. You know, what's, what's What's unbelievable, un unbelievable about this whole issue of climate change is that you don't know to what extent it can actually ravage, you know, places yeah. and people's lives. And when you consider that alone, and you uh, you now consider how it's really when you down mentally, now try to put yourself in the shoes of those people that feel it, you know, firsthand. It's really unfortunate. Yeah. I, I understand. I can relate to that, to be honest, because it was so anxiety inducing. I felt for those people. I was like, I was grateful I was not part of them. And I felt guilty for being grateful that I wasn't part of them. But then I was still worried about my own future. Like, okay, they are there now, they are experiencing it now. How am I going to experience it too? Because I, I realized temperature keep, keeps rising. Keep and then all, Nothing we are doing is really going to stop it. You just see um, Instagram, you might see articles where they are saying, oh, um, the government is planning to curb it or to stop it at two degrees C. But then you see that there are not really actions in place. They are not really doing anything to really stop it. So it's really anxiety inducing. Uh, I think Shilot is back. Hi, Shilot, welcome. Yeah. Um, hi, um, uh, excuse me, my uh, my network just really kicked me out really hard because like, you know, really there's no power to like me. Uh, an afterthought of, you know, the power outage. Oh, all right, that's fine. Uh, Leva and I were just discussing the second question. Uh, I, I would like you to answer the first question before you come to that. So Adam, the first question I asked Leva was, how we felt uh, in relation to climate change as an African? How does it? How did? How does climate change make you feel uh, in Africa? Somebody living in Africa, your experiences of climate change. Um, that's quite a good question and an interesting one, but also really difficult to answer. Like you know, generally, it's this actually not direct way to answer that but i think what i can say is that um climate change is a tearjerker and its darkness keeps thickening and it's it's a trigger in every domain and there's no right way of feeling about it it's you know um one moment you feel empowered and one moment you're feeling really frustrated like you know kind of like paralyzed you know by all this 
consequences that are unfolding in front of you, like, you know, this flooding, uh, there's, you know, drought, there's no electricity, there's no water, there's like, you know, um, land depredation, there's, you know, it's kind of like just a whole of a whole lot of things and, you know, trying to grasp, grasp everything at the same time. So it's kind of like, you know, um, it's traumatizing, I would say. Yeah, thank you, Shilos, for your answer. I can relate to that deeply. Uh, Lepa also spoke about how the trauma it feels when it just hears about climate change or see news, um, see news about climate change or the effects what other people are facing. Uh, our second question was, um, what events trigger your climate-related emotions? Like, what's, what happened that made you realize, oh, this this sadness I'm feeling, this anger I'm feeling, this frustration I'm feeling is related to climate change, is caused by climate change. Um, again, uh, that's not something I can actually pinpoint which event uh, triggers my climate related emotions. It's, it's quite a range of things. Uh, for example, when you're reading, uh, about, you know, uh, different, let's, let's say, for example, you're reading about psychology, you know, the works of psychologists and everything, and then you encounter, oh, okay, uh, when they start, then, you know, okay, it does affect people this way, and as well as um, living in, in a country uh, that is, you know, drought ridden or, you know, in a region where it's like, you know, drought stricken, it's kind of like, you know, a something that is like just kind of like it's it's an automatic you know response to whatever that is unfolding in front of you so it's um a trigger you know living in in, in a country which has no um mechanisms put in place to counteract uh or mitigate uh climate change uh effect is a trigger on its own. So I think that's kind of like, you know, just uh, wraps up, you know, the entire question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shilos, for your answer. So we'll just go right into uh, the next question. Lekwa, I'd like for you to answer this first. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it still relates to our third, um, our previous question. So this question is, how did you arrive at that feeling of echo anxiety? Uh, when did you first learn about the word echo anxiety? Does it fit right for how you feel? Do you think echo anxiety explains uh, um, how you feel? According to the psychology, uh, American Psychology Journal, it defines echo anxiety as this chronic fear of environmental doom. So do you think that word captures your feeling, your emotion about uh, climate change? Um, you know, uh, this, this question is, uh, you know, I, for really, well, okay, maybe it's just the word climate anxiety, but really I prefer to actually uh, use climate related emotions because it's kind of like more engulfing of what kind of, of what kinds of feeling and what kind of feelings, whether it's I don't think it's anything negative as long as it's for it's for force for good. But I kind of like prefer to use the word uh, related emotion. But however, um, I think it to some extent it's it's uh, it, it it covers feelings, the strong feelings that people might have, you know, regarding regarding the environment changing and the and the inaction people are having. You know, maybe little action people are having and looks like people are paying to how serious this issue is. But really actually uh, um climate climate related emotions is more ago. I feel like is I mean I could be I could be incorrect and I could be um corrected but like, I feel like climate related emotions is the more like engulfing because it covers other emotions as happiness with like so we love and for the environment people actually support your actions towards saving it as well. Oh, all right, Charlotte. How about you? How do you does echo anxiety cover your um your feeling? Do you think is is relevant? 
Well, Bitcoin that is quite <laughs> different um, from the way I see it, you know, looking at uh, region to region, especially when we are looking at, you know, the global north and the global south. So south, as far as I have seen, and as far as I have looked, as we have been living in, you know, uh, with the consequences of climate change, and with that insecurity comes, you know, a lot of emotions. It could be anxiety, it could be depression, it could be trauma. But I think eco anxiety really looks like, you know, sidelines other emotions that we have had, you know, in relation to climate change and, you know, its consequences. You know, uh, um, so it's kind of like eco anxiety to me, it does not sum up as people. Descendants uh, in Africa felt and go through and experience in our daily lives. Yes, inviting is a thing and it does exist, but in Africa, it's it's quite yeah, anxiety, which I wouldn't use eco anxiety, which I think I also settle with climate related emotions, just as you know, Liko said, because it's just not. I mean, it doesn't encompass Africans, you know, carry with us every day. Yeah. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I read an article by um, Sarah Ray, and she was saying um, eco anxiety is more like a white word uh, to assuage white guilt. Uh, I read an article about that sometime, and. Well, I just, for me, I feel like anxiety. Uh, I'm glad the world came about because that world brought about that consciousness that yes, my mental health can be affected by climate change. And then, <clears throat> sorry, there is something that, there is a word that describe it, describes it. I feel like the world might still, you know, mutate in the future, people add other things or maybe, um, newer words, but eco anxiety for now just brought about that consciousness. So we would now bring our own definitions to it. Like, like Sheila rightly said, in Africa, it is really not climate anxiety because climate change is related to um to homelessness in in a way. People that are being uh that their houses are being washed by floods, they become homeless. That's a feeling of despair. You might not call it anxiety, anxiety, but it's just for them, it's a present worry. It is not a future thing. They are feeling it right now. So you might not call it um, anxiety in that way. But I just like that word. I like the word eco anxiety because it just brought to consciousness that yes, mental health and climate change correlates. And yes, something can be done about it. Uh, thank you both for your response. Uh, our next question is a. Uh, uh, how do you cope with these feelings of um, eco anxiety in a way? How do you cope with the feelings of your climate related emotions? What are your coping strategies? I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a whole cocktail of several emotions, but uh, how I feel about, or rather how I cope with these feelings is, uh, I mean, like, first first of all, I cannot, you know, like, it, it's, I can't, I can't overemphasize the need for having a family, a community like that I can actually be very vulnerable with, I can actually share thoughts and feelings with, because, they are the ones that would actually, you know, when other people might try to question what you're feeling, they will understand you first, and that could actually be connection between you and, and, and your community. So, um, so basically, how I've been able to, how yeah, how I've been able to like cope with this is is basically, you know, being outspoken firstly about it, you know, and be ready to actually acknowledge that it could actually morph into several several other feelings and other other terms in the future, you know, and it's part of actually it's part of life right now and you know 
seeing it as, as, as it exists, basically, you understand, talking about it really helps me. Um, it helps me set his attention a bit. Yeah. Shilot, I would like to hear from you. How do you cope with equal anxiety, per se? Um, thank you for that question. And it's, it's a hard room to answer as well because because uh, I think the way I cope with equal anxiety is detaching myself you know, from time to time and you know, just detaching myself from all these things that are happening. And just food watch anime. And I think, you know, the, the more I'm watching anime, I, it relaxes my mind and also triggers a lot of, you know, response uh, as well uh, to global problems. But I think, you know, you know that I'm Excuse me, Shilot, I can't hear you clearly. Can you speak louder? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. A bit louder. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I was saying that. Um, for me, the way I cope with uh, eco anxiety is detaching myself from what is happening currently with the climate crisis and other global problems, like you know, binge watch on anime. And the more I'm watching on anime, sometimes it triggers you know the eco anxiety in me, and you know, so I find myself back in what I'm trying to you know um, run away from or trying. To for it, uh, but then you know, uh, it's kind of like it also differs from how we cope with eco anxiety. But I think for now, um, anime is okay. okay. Uh, I can relate to that anytime I just feel that that um surge of emotion, really, I just try to detach, like you both said, I just try to not use my phone, probably see a movie, a very soft movie, not, um, not a serious movie, like maybe uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Marvel movies, where you see people fighting about the destruction of the earth, that also <laughs> triggers my anxiety. <laughs> so I don't see maybe a soft room calm, something really calm that doesn't really stress me out, that, that works for me. Also, just try to detach, try to do things around me, not connecting to the global world. Because when I pick my phone, I'm connected on Instagram, connected on Twitter. I can see news from different places. I just try to be in my surrounding, in my local community, and take deep breaths. That works for me to just, it is going to be fine. Well, we've not exploded yet. So, we can still work we can still work and do something about it so and um, yeah. perhaps perhaps if i should also add that you know like a lot of people actually deal with face emotions in several ways and to some people to some people it's actually going out there to even appreciate the environment even more because yeah maybe like in the last like few weeks or few months all you've been hearing about is negative thing about the environment so like, maybe even going hiking or just for <laughs> even hiding, because last week sorry to cut you up, I went to kayak in um in the ocean and I was still seeing plastic, and I was like, oh my god, can't I just get a break from this pollution? <laughs> I'm kayaking yeah. because I need a break. Why is plastic still on my uh close to my boat and something like that? So I really try my best, but sometimes when you try. It's still in your place. It still finds a way, yeah. Yeah, so I, it's more of a mental um, resilience, really. Just in my head, trying to just, we are going to get through this. I am going to get through this. Uh, our activism, connecting to the environment, you know, we are, at least there are still some part of the environment, actually um, conserved part of the environment. Um, LCC, for instance, in Nigeria is a, conservation center where they conserve part of the forest. So going to places like that, connecting to how nature can be in a in its raw form. In, yeah. yeah, in its basic form. That that also works for me. So um Sheila, I don't know if you have any other things to add because uh, we are at the end of the panel discussion. We are going to open it up for questions now. So if you have any questions, uh, I would like for you to drop them in the chat box. Leko and Shiloh are happy to answer any question. 
Shiloto, do you have anything to add before we start taking questions? About your students, she just goes hiking, and you kind of like going hiking alone. Uh, this actually a grassland. Oh, uh, uh, can you see? Uh, the network is kind of breaking. Right now? Yeah, now. Hmm. I just added into what Nico was saying. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just you know, to cope with the anxiety, and I think we have also picked up on this habit of caring. Um, going like you know, with me, you know, um, the reusable. Uh, that back trash in just because I said you know when I'm walking on the on the grasslands um, you know trash when people hiking they just forget that oh this place nobody lives here so there's nobody to clean so I just kind of like you know pick it up trash it's fun and it's annoying but yeah it's also result and also thinking of uh for Facebook Instagram news platforms because I don't want to wake up to headlines of you know bad news and negative news about the environment or anything else. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Sheila. So we've come to the end of uh, the discussion. I would like for anyone in the audience to drop in their questions in the chat box. So if you have any question relating to what we've discussed, uh, I would like to, or if you have any questions for the um, speakers, I would love to see them in the chat box. Well, I have a question here. Uh, so I just want to ask, is eco-anxiety a useful emotion um, for you, Shilot? Sorry, I think I had a question. Is eco-anxiety a useful emotion for you? Um, yeah, it is definitely because I often say uh, to my friends that um, your anxiety is sometimes the greatest source of your solutions. So I think it's not overall a bad emotion, but you know, kind of like um, a wake up call that you know what we are going through this. So, you know, how about we look into uh, solutions? What can we do about it? In uh, thank you, Sheila. Lekwa, do you have anything to add to that? Could you repeat the question? Is eco-anxiety a useful emotion for you? Well, most definitely it is because, you know, you know for, for me in particular, it has validated the feelings that I've been feeling about the environment you know, in the past, you know. One of our sea change, sudden changes in the environment and the paranoia, you know, that it brings us all. So it kind of makes me feel like, okay, yeah, okay, this is, 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 I think it's obviously, it is, you know, a universal feeling, but I wouldn't say obviously that was cause of climate anxiety, the term, but I mean, the, the, the term just brought that sense, okay, this is, it has always been a universal feeling, but now we know it has to be. This particular thing. So, it was a formal identification of this term? I mean, of this field is already existed. So, yeah, most definitely useful. Yeah. Um, I saw something that says um, eco anxiety is um a LD reaction to the climate crisis. You've been anxious about what is going to happen. You've been anxious about your future. It is normal. It is human for you to feel that way. Uh, people that are not anxious should be the ones to check themselves, to be honest, <laughs> because it's a normal reaction. You are seeing the news, you are hearing all these things. So, yeah. Uh, Yasmin has a question here for us. She says, uh, at the same time as dealing with anxiety about crisis unfolding in the present time, do you think um, about the future? She says, do you think much about the future and what happens if and when you do? I don't know if you got the question. Hey boy, to be nice, repeat it again, please. Can I, okay. can I add, 
can I can I um add to my question? I yeah. suppose like I was I was listening to this distinction between eco anxiety maybe in the West where there's a lot of anxiety about the future and eco anxiety yeah. in countries where or places in the world where you know the 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 crisis is unfolding in front of your eyes and so it's yeah. here and now. And um, but then I thought actually it's not just that is it because you've got that plus the future, and so yeah. uh, it's like a yeah I'm just interested in the well, project. Your body. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, Lekwa, would you like to answer that? Yeah, le well, let me give my opinion on that. Yeah, um, yeah it's you know, like like the like this, this this whole webinar is all about from an African perspective, and you know, I'm sure we've all we've all heard about the statistics of of the World Bank and the UN about the about the uh, the the food crime, the food insecurity. The, the environment changing, the immigration problems that we're having, the migration problems that we're having, and all these things actually could be multiplied, you know, because of this. This is actually, this particularly is, is my, should I, I can't, I could, I can't say it's my biggest fear, you know, when, when, when it comes to climate change. The fact that, you know, Africa already is some, somewhat already um, dealing with all these problems and that we have, they're already daunting, you know, in reality, and then we have this other problem that we can't, that no rug is big enough to be swept up to for, for these issues to be swept underneath, it, underneath them. Yeah, thank you, Lekwa. Sheila, do you have anything to add to that? That's a good question, Yasmin, because I, um, for some like um, from South Africa, um, South Africa is actually one of the, is it's also popularly known for its diversity. So I think it's easier to see when you know uh, you know uh, climate change is having severe impacts on it, and you know kind of like um, grasslands where I go hiking uh, often, it's it's actually. It's, a little of it, you know, is purely protected and, you know, it's purely, you know, that's like, you know, a piece of it is left, you know, for us to conserve and protect. And, you know, um, so also looking into something like the Sakin Karu Biome is one of the South Africa's biodiversity lot. Only 7% of the 30% that is um, legally protected. And it's, it's, it's just so frustrating when you see all that withering away and you want to do so much, but on the other hand, there's, you know, food insecurity, there's water crisis, and, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you sit there and ask yourself, am I even doing enough? And then you start thinking about the future, and when we look at Africa, Africa does not have, you know, effective, uh, resources, mechanisms, infrastructure, we would say, oh yeah, at least there is this that will protect us, you know, or help us in terms of adapting, you know, and, you know, to the consequences of climate change. So it's sort of like also our mental health systems are also not really effective because even a fraction of our population is receiving mental health services. It's kind of like when you think about the future, it's, you become, really, really frustrated and even on the verge of succumbing to that display. So it's, it's like that. Yeah, thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, both of can you I also add on to this one? Yeah. Um, you can also, do that. Yeah, the, given the fact that, you know, um, me mental health in, in Africa is something that's not really taken really seriously. And of course, that even has its own, you know, implications when it's not taken seriously. So for the kind of future that we're already in decision, you know, because of climate change and um, the investment that it brings, it's on, on, on every, you know, on every individual, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like very indiscriminate on every individual. So for in, for people that don't take their mental health seriously, it, it, it could be, um, it could be felt way deeper. You know, because it's become like a shock. Whereas for some people that have taken this, I mean, there is no right way to, to prepare for this, but 
there could be some amount of uh, uh, readiness, you know, to this to this feeling and emotions. Yeah. Um. Thank you guys so much. Um. I would just like to add that uh, yes, you can feel. Sometimes I feel ignorance is bliss, like not knowing about it is that might be bliss. But then I just. It's better to know now, like you said, Lekwa, and be ready for it, to know what's happening now and then how you can try to adapt, mitigate in the future, try to build your mental resilience from now before we start feeling um, the greater effects of climate change. Uh, thank you so much. Yasmin, I hope you answered your question. Yeah, and um, Jennifer also has something to add here. Yeah? Jennifer says, uh, Uh, so Jennifer says, the complexity of the crisis in regions in the global south presents a multiplied psychological impact. Useful to also assess this impact from a climate justice lens. Yeah, so it, I, I, I get that because it is multidimensional. You are not just, your mental health, you are not just bothered about climate change, you are bothered about society collapse, you are bothered about drought, you are bothered about the economic implications of things like that, migration. So all those things held together can be a lot. And then we also need to see what does the global north have to add to this? Because if we check our history, they were the ones that come here to pillage and take all our natural resources. So how can they do right in a way? Because there is nothing they can do that can really change that mental trauma that has happened in the past. But how can they try to make things right right now? You no, know, uh, I, I was saying something about COP, about funding, saying we're going to fund the global south, but still, we are still not seeing anything. We are still not seeing action. And that is what we need. What we need, I think, right now to help mitigate this uh, mental health crisis or the climate crisis is action, climate justice. People owning up and saying, uh, countries from the global north owning up and saying, yes, we did this, yes, we'd like to help you. Because when you leave it to African leaders alone, <laughs> most of them are not even concerned. So we, and um, sometimes the old countries in the, uh, in the global north, um, when they get, uh, 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 there's just what I want to put, they owe them in high regard. So when countries in the global north can try to enforce it on our leaders, like, okay, you guys have to do this. This is the money here. Yeah. This is the finances here. Yeah. Do this for your people. Try to take action to mitigate this uh, particular crisis for your people. I think that is going to help out. So uh, uh, we've passed our perhaps. time. Okay, all right. No problem. And then there is another question. So sorry about that, Lekwa, but I would like us yeah. to take this question too. So Shei says, hi, my name is Shei. In Africa, we have other problems that people could perceive as more pressing, including poverty, unemployment. How then, how, okay, um, sorry, she said, how do we then make people see that climate change is equally important uh, and be placed at the same level as those issues? Sheila, would you like to go first? So the question basically is saying people, are facing going through other things in Africa, poverty, unemployment. So they don't really take climate change as something serious or as something pressing, probably because of ignorance and lack of information. So she's saying, how can we make people see that climate change is also uh, as equally as important as unemployment and poverty in a way? Hi. Um I, th I think that's actually um, a question that also contains awareness because uh, when you read newspaper articles, and, you know, when you go to online platforms like Instagram, you see a lot of young people who have access to the smartphone. Um, they are aware, they are posting about these issues, but that's just a fraction of the whole huge population in Africa, especially in the rural communities, the rural communities in Africa actually harbor many people compared to, to urban areas. So it's a matter of you know, awareness and how information is disseminated 
you know, for example, we have a lot of scientific papers and, you know, uh, we have a lot of books, but when you look into that, how many people are, are, are reading, how many people have access to that information? So it's kind of like when it comes to climate change and when you look at climate change and poverty, there's no problem that is actually more pressing than the other. They are all equally psychologically impactful. So it's a matter of, you know, how do we disseminate this information to the people? Of course, we cannot force people to understand what's going on, but I think the more we make people aware and understand the problems, the more we share the information with them. Like for example, how about take people to um, a local nature reserve, let them see what's happening explain to them, you know, how does this, you know, how this actually affects employment and how does this, you know, also, you know, contributes to poverty because climate change does really have a huge contribution to poverty and unemployment. So it's kind of like, it's like said, it's all about how do we disable information to, 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 to these people, do we engage with them? because we doing a lot of science Work, like you know research and all of that but are we engaging these people are we actually bringing them into the rooms are we calling them in to understand these issues because we sort of like you know have a lot of courage in calling people for not doing the right thing are we also doing enough having the same courage to call them in to understand what's going on thank you shilos um liqua in like a minute or less would you like to add something to that too? Yeah, um, uh, you know, the, the, the reason why people haven't, you know, taken these issues very seriously is because when it comes to other issues like job security and uh, food and all those things, because they have found a connection between their, so their sustenance and those, and those other problems. So I think if, you know, finding the, there are several connections, but Finding a connection that's particular to every person, you know, would actually help the person understand that we look at this as a very big issue and, you know, try to hi highlight the future of their children being at stake, the kind of future they hope for their children being at stake would actually make them uh, more understanding to the climate change they understand. Hmm. Thank you so much for that. Shei, I hope we answered your question. That was a very um, great question. Uh, we are we have two minutes left so thank you all for joining our webinar uh we appreciate having you all here i hope we've all learned something because i have really learned a lot from this our session and then uh excuse me yeah so i have really learned a lot from our session and uh I'm glad we are having this conversation because first thing is discussing it, putting it into people's consciousness so they can know, okay, yes, this is a thing. Then comes uh, how can we how can we help? How can we try to, you know, reduce this feeling? Because every time I feel anxious, I'm like, what can I do to, you know, to to put this feeling in the back burner? And that brings me to activism, volunteering for stuff, trying to advocate letting other people know because i feel the more you know and then when you truly know uh the effects of this stuff you would want to work towards it you want to fight your government you want to you know hold people accountable like we have to do something about this because not only is it affecting me presently but it's going to affect me in future and it will probably affect my future generations too so i'm really glad we are having a uh, this conversation. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you being here. So, uh, now that we are here, we are running a survey on eco anxiety in Nigeria. So, we'd like to know as a Nigerian, how do you feel uh, about eco anxiety? I am going to drop the link in the chat box. Kindly fill our survey. Also, if you'd like to donate to us, I would also drop the link in the chat box. No amount is too small, <laughs> like we say in Nigeria. So if you'd like to donate uh, to TIP and our cause, because we run a uh, psychotherapy session for people who can really deal with 
or who are finding it hard to deal with climate change and and its effects on them. We run a psychotherapy section. You can check our website also. I will drop the link in the comment section also. So thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate having you. Uh, we are going to share the link to our next webinar when it is out. And also the recording for this webinar will be sent to our emails. So thank you all. I am so happy to have this conversation with you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Lekwa. Thank you, Shilot, for your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye, Isabel.